down. Reel down again. Little step. Little oh my God. One or two at a time. That's, that's Let's insane. Go. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Caleb with the Fish and Fuel Podcast. Welcome back to another special episode where our goal uh, is to teach you uh, new tips and techniques from some of the best anglers that are out there uh, to help you be more productive uh, on your next time out on the water. Um, I've got a great angler with me today. He's actually a catch the fever angler. Um, just somebody who really breaks down, uh, the day to day in the body of water that he fishes and does a phenomenal job. I mean, just a great guy. Uh, introduce yourself, tell everybody where you fish and uh, a little bit about your guide business and, uh, what body of water you fish on. Sure. Yeah. Hey, what's up, guys? I'm uh, Captain Christian Moore. I fish the tidal water region in Virginia on the Rappahannock and the James River primarily. Yeah, absolutely. And how long have you been a cat fisherman? How long have you been doing this, Christian? I think the first time I went catfishing, Caleb, was in 2005 on yeah. the Dan River. Right. So good, good amount of time. Absolutely, absolutely. And how long have you been guiding? Uh, got my captain's license May of last year, so almost a year. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's been doing pretty good. It has been. It's been really good these past few months. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Well, uh, guys, the focus of this podcast is really, you know, how to target catfish in tidal water. Now, if you're listening to this episode and you're like, well, this probably, this one definitely wouldn't apply to me because I don't fish or I don't have a tidal reservoir. Um, there's a lot of things that you can pick up, uh, because the interesting thing about fishing tidal water or a tidal river is depending on where you're at, mm -hmm. current is flowing one way and then it can turn around and flow the other way. Very true. Good point. Below the fall line. Mm -hmm. So no matter, uh, you know, w what goes on in that body of water, it's, it, 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 it makes fish do things when it, when, you know, when conditions change. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about fishing in the river fishing a, a you know tidal tide fishing for tidal water catfish sure. and um kind of what's some of the stuff that you notice how these fish behave how, how these fish act and what they do okay caleb i would say one thing that's contributed to uh, my success the most is just being observant yeah of my surroundings if yeah. you will i feel like fish in general are their behavior is a product of their environment Right. Mm -hmm. uh, with the region of the country that I fish and it being tidal, um, you have different tides. You have uh, what's called a spring tide. Right. Spring tide is, you know, after a new moon when your fluctuation and uh, elevation of the water is going to change more. Say on a normal tide, it may only rise two feet, but on a, a good spring tide, we might see three to four foot swing in the water level. Yeah. Now, how does that relate to fishing? Well, during the springtime, obviously that much water fluctuation, you've got heavier currents. Right. Those heavier current scenarios can uh, present a, a couple different uh, options for you to kind of target these fish. Uh, one being uh, the uh, peak tide, yeah, if you will. So what I've learned and seen over the years it's kind of after the tar tide starts and it starts to get towards its peak where it's moving its fastest, it's kind of like an on switch for them, right? Right, right. They, they start to to feed a little bit heavier uh, in normal conditions. And uh, I try to set up on areas that are just out of that main channel to where I'm going to get them on the way to feed, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So you say just out of the main channel. Right. If it's first thing in the morning, I haven't been on the water for a few days, I'll, I'll do kind of like a surveying set, if you will. I'll, I'll pick a deep ledge kind of on a narrower portion of the river 
where you know s- smaller area the river's going to be running harder i can set up on a channel and i can put some baits that are deep and then i can put some on the ledge where i'm at and then get some up on the flat so you highly recommend you know especially you know really where you're fishing or, or any river this would apply to when you're first getting started out there you know offering those baits in in different places so you can kind of pick up on what the fish are are they shallow or are right. they eating deep it, it kind of it gives me an indicator on, on a lot of days that something i can dial in on and as i progress throughout the day kind of target that region a little yeah. bit heavier and that that kind of brings me to my, my next point because you're already hitting on it is you know how do you determine what depth to fish you know a lot of guys when they're put their boat especially on the james river you know right up here um i love the james river been fishing the james river for a while and you know talking with guys at the boat ramp they're like how deep were you catching them it seems like some people they're they're curious as to you know how do you determine how deep to fish that day yeah, that's a, that's a really good question caleb I, I would say uh a big determining factor of that is going to be uh what one what time of year it is right you know we're we're getting into the you know we're in the springtime right now the water temperatures are tipping into the mid 60s the males are starting to clean out beds so they're moving shallower so typically I'm going to look in regions right now that are 25 foot and shallower as they're transitioning into their bedding areas. Right, right. Now, is that just for kind of this time of year or does your pattern kind of change during the summer? It it, it it'd change to a certain degree because, I mean, all fish, their they're happy zone temperature-wise is, you know, 60 to that 75 degree range. Um, obviously, in the summertime, that water gets warmer. Uh, a lot of times, they'll go deep. To, to find cooler water, mm-hmm. especially if it's a, a bluebird sky and it's real hot. Yeah, I've always had a hard time uh, catching fish on those days. And it's really, I guess, maybe lack of patience because you are burning up when, you know, it's summertime, bluebird sky, not yeah, really. Well, the thing about a bluebird sky, man, I feel like, you know, the water's so clear and the fish's uh, sense of awareness is heightened. Sure. And the bait fish that these catfish were trying to catch prey on, they're a lot more aware of their surroundings and not as easy for the catfish to catch. And that's Absolutely. why it's hard for us to catch them on Absolutely. days like that. So when you see if it's a day where, uh, you know, the sun is being able to absolutely, you know, go through further layers of the water mm-hmm. and it's a bluebird sky, you will fish deeper. Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. And I'm not, you know, don't, don't be afraid to check, you know, 50, 60, 70 foot of water. The James River presents a lot of, yeah. Some of the bends has some deeper holes, and I've caught some really good fish midsummer. Wow. In deep water. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, it takes a while to get a big fish out of 70 foot of water, doesn't it? Yeah, and you got to be careful with him. Yeah. Bring him up slow and, and make sure he's not, his swim bladder's not inflated. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. And you had talked about the bait fish's uh, sense of awareness, you know, when the sun's out. Let's talk about bait fish now for just a little bit. You know, uh, do you, you, what type of bait are you using? Do you use that same bait throughout the entire time of the year? Or do you change your bait with different seasons or, or does it change? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, it changes because obviously in tidal rivers, uh, we get different species that come up into the rivers. Um, right now you've got hickory shad running up there. They actually start, uh, when that water tips into that 50 degree mark, they'll start, you know, coming up into the bay and the mouth of the rivers, but they're, uh, they're very heavily in the river right now. You know, water 65 degrees. That's a good bait. I would say the downside to a hickory shad, the head's really good because it's a hardy piece of bait. It'll yeah. stay on the hook good. Right. But the body of that fish is soft. It's oily, puts off a good scent trail, but you, uh, I would caution people if they use it, constantly check your hooks make sure you got bait on there you know if you're not getting uh, any activity in 10 15 minutes really didn't check it and one of the big mistakes that happen and we all do it we all forget is after you hook your piece of bait make sure to check the tip absolutely yeah don't leave a scale on there because that can be heartbreaking yeah another good one this time of year is perch i love white perch it uh it's a real firm piece of bait stays on the hook well and they're not going to get it off as easily as a, you know, a, a piece of shad. Right. How do, how are you getting your white perch? How do you target them to use them for bait on the river? Sure. Uh, a lot of times I net them in the cast net yeah. early morning before I get there around bridges. 
And I also use, you know, just like a, a two hook drop shot tipped with a little piece of shad or some worm. That's a really good uh, strategy to get them. Yeah. And then you're catching those kind of like out of the current, like in the backwaters. Out of stuff. the current, backwaters, shallow areas. Uh, first thing in the morning when the sun's coming up, uh, like the barge pits and shower areas, six feet and under is a good place to catch them right now. Yeah. And they're a lot of fun to catch too. Oh, they are a lot of fun. Like sometimes I take customers out and they have a ball doing that. Yeah. And them little things, man, they're armored tanks. They are. They got a million ways to stick you. Yeah, they do. They have a, re- <laughs> they, they, that's what we call them, stiff backs. Stiff backs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, uh, that, yeah, they'll, they'll definitely get you. That's for sure. Yes, they will. But, all right, so. With the with, with the bait, how do you hook your bait? I feel like we a lot of people are like, oh man, what you know? What's the best bait? Shad, you know. It's, I feel like people don't put enough emphasis. Like when you said you'll use shad and then you'll transition and you'll use white perch. Mm-hmm. When it comes to hooking baits and really breaking down what's the best baits to use during certain times, I feel like sometimes it's overlooked a lot. When it comes to hooking your bait, okay, how do you hook your bait? Um, some people. They'll take the bait and they'll come right in the side of the cut and come straight out the top. Some people hook it in the bottom. Some people go at an angle. What do you, how do you prepare your baits? So when I say we've got a piece of gizzard shad, right? You just cut it up normally. What I tend to do is I'll put the hook uh, down in the belly section of the fish. One, it's uh, it's tougher. It is tougher. It's, you know, you've got the, a denser plate material to put the hook through to stay on there better. And another reason I do it, I feel like it, it can uh, potentially increase your hookup ratio because when the fish comes up and grabs that bait, initially it's going around the thicker part of the bait. Correct. And then his mouth is going to close over it and get that hook closer to where it needs to be to set. Right. Because if you're hooking it on the bottom, there's a smaller, thinner area where that hook's at and you have less in the way. That's right. If you hook it on the back, you know, there you've got something that wide with the hook that's trying to get hooked versus something that's thinner in his mouth. I love that. Yeah, it, I've, I, I switched up and started doing it that way probably maybe four or five years ago and definitely have seen a increase in hook sets. I like that. I like that. And what size hooks are you using? I use 10 alt. 10 alt circle like, hooks? Yep. Yeah. Like a modified, they're, uh, you get them at Whisker Seeker Tackle. Yeah, yeah. The triple threats. That's right, yep. yep. Heard a lot of good things about those hooks. I know there's there's several guys that, that mm-hmm. run those now and, and had good success with them. Good hook, absolutely. Yeah. All right, so we went over, you know, how you hook your bait and everything. Like that. Now let's talk about um, when you anchor up on a spot. You're anchored up on a spot, and now you're ready to cast out to those fish. Mm-hmm. Um, we did a, uh, a video re- with you, um, and you were giving tips and tricks for guys who are fishing on the river, how to set up on a spot. And we've got our bait. We've got it hooked. Now, are are you generally fishing structure? And if so, uh, how do you set up on that structure and how are you cast into it? You made a good point in that video we did where a lot of guys can, you know, cast over right. what they're fishing for and think, oh, well, there was no sure. fish here. Sure. Well, if I'm fishing structure, it, it depends. It, a lot of times it depends on what type of structure. Mm-hmm. If it's rock piles or something or just a, you know, an underwater island that's got a depression back behind it, I kind of put the boat about even with that area. Right. And drop the baits just right off the back. I don't even cast them for, we're talking, I don't know, 15, 20 feet of line out. However yeah. deep water is, 30 feet of line out. That's right. That's right. Um, something else I do, not just on fishing structure, I, I think it may would help people out. Uh, when you're out on the main river and fishing outside the channel, kind of like a big flat, when I cast my rods out, I'll throw my outside rods the furthest and then step it in to where my ones in the back are the shortest, kind of creating a natural funnel, if you will, to, to draw that, to puts the centra and it kind of draws them in. And that, uh-huh. that, that has, uh, paid off. Absolutely. And also I can think about when you said that, you know, when a fish, um, hits and he, cut sideways i'm sure that has to help with that i mean because uh, absolutely okay because you don't you don't want to put your baits close to one another especially yeah. in heavy current because then you're going to be fighting that fish getting tied up in another line so i definitely try to spread them out like that and kind of that v formation or and or stagger them right. one long one short one long one short yeah 
I like that. That way, whatever he hits, whatever direction he's going, you can always just reel up that one rod and you've got that whole level of play. A lot of guys, they just get busy or they get excited and they just start throwing rods out and they don't even think about staggering them. That's that's a good, yeah, that, that's a, a really good point that you brought up. And I've had to caution myself as I've become a guide and had inexperienced anglers on the boat. A lot of times I find myself getting rods out of the way. Yeah. That fish is having their way with them and I got to, you know, prepare to get, get the net out. And it sometimes it, it gets fun. Absolutely. Sure. And sometimes you just need a good pair of scissors. For real. When a fish yeah. comes in the boat and you got a mess. Mm-hmm. Yep. And uh, also, one of the things I was going to talk to you about is rigs. Okay. Yeah, yeah. What kind of rigs are you using when you're targeting these 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 catfish? I run a, a traditional Carolina rig. Yeah. Uh, and then I also run a, a three-way rig. And I'll do uh, different drops off the lead line mm-hmm. depending on uh, if those fish are inactive and they're not really feeding but they're maybe traveling a little bit i'll monitor the graph and see how far they are up off the bottom and kind of control that with that drop on the piece of lead right to get it kind of in their target area where they're moving okay yeah now how do you how long do you make your leaders a lot of time i mean some I have, guys use uh you know 18 inches some guys use 24 and some guys use even longer how do you yeah i feel like one fishing current you don't really want to use a long leader because mm-hmm. you're getting that whip effect you right. know if you've got 36 inches of leader out there and it's that anchor point to that piece of lead that's kind of like a pendulum and it's allowing that bait to move a lot more in the current maybe probably going to make it a little bit harder for him to get after so i try to, i keep my leader somewhere between that 18 to 24 inch range i got you i meant to ask you that when we we're going over the the hooks and and mm-hmm. stuff like that and, and it dawned on me and i was curious to know what kind of what kind of setup you run and that's a really good point with that whip effect you know yeah. with too long of a leader is, is that is that actual the truth but I don't know, but I feel like since I've went to shorter leaders, it is that has helped as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Christian, let's talk about some of your favorite spots um, that you have found that really produce. Okay. Everybody, you know, who's really good in the game, if if they aren't a guide or if they're a guide or, or they fish, you know, a certain body of water a lot, they've got spots certain times of the year mm-hmm. that really do really well. Let's talk about those spots what those areas look like what's down there that makes it such a good spot so guys listening they could say okay next time i'm out i'm going to try to target areas like that as well sure um i would say one of my favorite uh conditions uh we were talking about spring tide earlier that's right when the river's running really hard you've got high current um pick an area somewhere close to where the river's narrow mm-hmm. got a lot of current but it has a flat close to it or a back channel nice somewhere where the current is half the speed or a lot slower oftentimes more than not i have uh landed some really good fish when the river is ripping but i'm set up on kind of a low current scenario uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be close to structure doesn't just graph it take a look at it if there's good fish there give them a shot i like that i like that so somewhere where there's a lot of there it seems like there's there's strong current flow mm-hmm. and then there's like a flat you know right over right. there adjacent to yeah, it your, your strongest current flow is always going to be in the channel right and it, it's, right. It's, it's clearly marked on your even your basic maps that come on your your depth mm-hmm. finder get outside of that find some some water say if the the main channel is 35 to 40 foot split that in half as you're coming off the flat and and you can read the water you can tell when it's slowing down and you're getting less current uh you can feel it in your boat if you turn your boat into it just watch how how fast you're moving on the graph and you know what your boat normally runs when you're idling in still water yeah and you can kind of use that as an indicator to figure out what what speed of current you're fixing to set up in and i feel like there's like now don't don't get it twisted i've caught some some hammers in really heavy current sure it, it happens but a lot of times, you know, they're like, you know, me and you, when they're wanting to relax, they're not wanting to burn those calories. They're going to get out of that main river and kind of get into that slower current. Slower, that's right. That's and right. Plus, when you're, you know, 
when you're a predator and you're chasing, you know, your dinner, it's a lot less resistance in Absolutely. that in that slower current for sure. Yeah, I feel like the 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 bigger they get, they're uh they're creatures of habit. Yeah. And uh they get lazy. They they want that easy meal. Absolutely. It what you're saying is a hundred percent correct because um this has been many years ago now. Um I was fishing the James River and um and caught that one that was over a hundred pounds yeah, on video. I'd love to hear that story. What, what tell us about that night, Caleb? Well, it was a situation that was just like what you're describing. Okay. The channel was over here on the on how was I set up? Yep. The channel was over on my right and then it got really shallow. It's a flat on the left. And we the fish were literally right in the middle, like what you're talking about, right on that line. And when mm -hmm. I hear you talk, I'm just like, he's so right, you know. That's just a really good place to find a absolute monster fish. But um yeah, it was kind of crazy that day. We had fished all day, and uh, I, I told the guy with me, Dylan, I said, look, let's stop, you know, at this one last place. We're going to fish somewhere we never fished. Right. And we went up in this cut, and uh, we're running the fish finder. And for anybody who wants to see that video on YouTube, it's, it's titled uh, The Largest Blue Catfish Ever Caught on Film. And we're we're easy along with side imaging and we actually saw those big fish and they were in this scenario just like what you're talking about i even remember saying on the video all right down there's the channel this is kind of right here coming up on this flat and you could see those big fish that were together right and we dropped the front anchor and set on this fish we were there probably 35 40 minutes so i was like man they're just they're just not gonna bite and if when you watch that video You'll notice it was daylight when I started fighting the fish, and it was nighttime when we were releasing them. And that's because it was literally 15, 20 minutes before it got dark. And when we first got there, an hour and a half previous, you know, it was it was daylight. Those fish were not feeding. They were they were around where they were going to be feeding. Mm -hmm. And they weren't biting. And then that window opened up. Yep. And he bit. And when he did, it was hellacious. I remember I was at the front of the boat. We were we were doing something in the front compartment. And I heard fiberglass screaming. I mean, it, it, it was that glass rod was bent all the way over. And you just know when a rod is just torqued. Right. I look back, all the rods are standing up. And then I see that one that's just down. So I immediately go over there and it's in the video, fight that fish. I knew he was big. I knew he was an absolute monster. But when I couldn't pick him up over the side of the boat, I really, I looked back at the camera and was like, he's filming me. Like, I got a muscle up here. Right. I'm just so used to bringing 60 pound fish over the side. But it was kind of like what Tyler said when I interviewed Tyler Barnes with the state record flathead. He said, I thought he was, you know, 60 pounds. But then you realize the size of the fish when... Yeah, you know it when you go to bring him in the boat, you're like, oh, I got something. Yeah, normally yeah. I can swing this over. Right. And I remember when he came in the boat, and it's on that camera and uh, on on film, and then we waited, and it was 111. And uh, I was just like, oh, my God, nobody's going to believe this. And we stuck him in the live well, and I remember I was like, dude, like this is incredible. So I knew the the Virginia State state record is also the world record. Right. So I knew, right. you know, there's no nothing to be had from this fish. There's no no point in putting them in the live well and taking them to be certified or anything. Um, but yeah, it was on a big but, game scale. But, but still, man, that's that's the fish we're all after. It's that, crazy. That's and, you know, a heck of a fish. That was about six years ago when I caught that fish. And mm. honestly, people have asked about the success of the brand and the rods. Mm-hmm with catch the fever and the big cat fever rods. And I just feel like God has had his hand on this business so hard. And sure. if you're listening to this, if you're a competitor or if you're somebody who is, is looking to, you know, do something to damage this brand or anything like that, it ain't going to happen. Like right. God has had his hand on this because Christian, this is a side note right here. The big cat fever rods came out one week after that fish was caught. I remember like we didn't even have a retailer. We didn't have nothing. We just had a few people that had bought them because, you know, they heard us talking about them. And I said, you know what? I'm taking three days off work and I'm going to go down there and try to film 
catching a big fish. Catching right. a big fish. That's and awesome. I get. I was able to catch the biggest, to my knowledge, blue catfish that on the on that river that has actually been weighed. You know, you can actually see its weight. It wasn't certified. Sure. It was on a big, a new big game scale, but um, it's just he did that. And then we got retailers all in that area. They heard about that, and then it just had a state record caught the next month from Zach Royce. It's just. God has just led this. It was a very good uh, snowball effect for marketing, if you will. It was. And just so you guys know, a fish that size, we're talking a tenth of a tenth of a tenth of a percent of the fish in that body of water. Like, when they they get over 100 pounds, there's very few of them. Absolutely. And that's uh, incredible you got to do that, man. Congratulations. Uh, It was, man. And uh, I appreciate it. And retailers started calling. They were curious about about this video and this these rods that just come out because I was talking about the rods in the video. I was just elated. And, uh, yeah, it was just something really cool that I think about every now and then. I'm like, man, if I had caught that fish like a week before, right. it would have been on a a, a, a a different rod or something. You know, we'd been using something else. Or if I wouldn't have went, like, I don't know. I think if Man upstairs was looking out, brother. It was. I think if you're going to be a guide, if you're going to look, if you're going to start a – uh, a trash company if you're looking to start a fishing rod brand i feel like anything you get into and you're getting into it for the right reasons right and the decisions that you're making are a hundred percent with the genuine mindset that you're not trying to outdo the next guide or you're not trying to outdo the next company you're at you're literally just trying to you're compete with yourself compete with yourself that's it that's right there is nothing, there is not a force that can stop you from being successful. And I think about you in that same way is how the type of person you are, where you've come in fishing and how you continue to go, you know, helping anglers and, and, and also improving your game every time you go out on the water. Absolutely. So, uh, I mean, that's one of the reasons I became a guy, Kevin, because right. I enjoy seeing people catch fish and putting putting smiles on those kids faces or anybody period yeah. That's, yeah. that's that's an awesome feeling man yeah absolutely absolutely and i've taken i in the early beginnings I, I used to take people fishing and that really is the best part that for sure people go out there and they've never seen you know they thought that you know you ask them what's the biggest fish i caught they're like yeah i caught 130 pounds i mean he was every bit of this big you're like oh well, i'm about to show you what a real 30 pounder looks like right you know they get excited when they actually see how big those fish get yeah, it's been it's been an all new level of excitement for me just just in my fishing career because, uh, you know, I've caught fish in that 60, 70, 80, even ninety pound class fish, and you know, I'm looking for that hundred pounder. Will I ever get him? Right. Who knows? That's a fish of a lifetime. But now seeing it through other people, it's it's brought a whole new you know level of excitement to my fishing. And I really enjoy it. Absolutely. I think about that one eleven. How how big he is now. Because on the James right. River, it's you don't hear about triple digit fish being caught, and um, I wonder how big he is now. Yeah, you'll hear it maybe maybe once or twice a year. Yeah, maybe some years you know there's some no years hunters. we have a like a, a pause, but right, it's weird to me on on the James River where that that fish was caught. You hear about a hundred, one hundred nine, um, one eleven, or or. It seems like where are those fish that are like 120, 130? Because Timothy King came in and I mean, he caught one that was every bit of 130 or better on Kerr Lake. And Kerr Lake has had some right there near the world record. But I wonder why on the James River, we just you don't know, see that 120, 130. I've had this conversation a lot with the a lot of the local tournament anglers and, and other guides in that area. And we all kind of chalk it up to the same thing with it being tidal and the water running so hard all the time. I don't know if they're actually going to get an opportunity to get that big because they're constantly always burning those calories. That makes whereas, a lot of sense. Whereas on Kerr, you know, they it's a smorgasbord, right? Yeah. It's a it's a free for all, and they eat as much as they want when they want, and if they want to relax and not not burn those current uh, calories, they can. Yeah, I mean, the only current on Kerr like, is when they're you know generating water at the dam, and then also. Right. on the other end where the rivers come in but still it's you know negligible it's not heavy current they can yeah. move out of that it, with ease mm-hmm. yeah it's not yeah that makes a lot of sense that question me. comes up a lot i have always have a lot of customers that are, like, are we going to catch a world record today i'm like 
I don't know if that is obtainable in this body of water. I really don't. Anything's possible. It I'm, is. I'm not saying that, that a 140, 150-pound fish is never going to come out of the James River or the Rappahannock River. But what you're saying is it's going to be hard for me to, to weigh 200 pounds if I'm walking on a treadmill all day. Exactly. That's you know, what you're saying. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. When you're burning that many calories, it's hard to right to put on weight when you're constantly running. For you know, sure. In that current. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Well, look, Christian, let's talk more of guys that are on the water that are putting their boat in and and what's some of the stuff that that they need to look for, like to determine a spot. I know you said one spot is current right adjacent from a flat looking for that shallow water you know fishing a river or a, t- a tidal river mm-hmm. what's some other things that they need to be looking for is it how the water moves across the top whether it's a boil whether there's you know how do you, what, what's some of the things that you need to be looking for to be like hmm, i need to check that spot <clears throat> look at the surface of the water Okay. That's a good indication of uh, what may be happening underneath. And then you can go over there, graph it. Uh, look at your topography map. A lot of your uh, elevation changes in the, the bottom of the river can create uh, low current scenarios. You don't only have to fish structure to find low current. It can be a depression or the way absolutely you know, inside bend on the river if it's got a hump on that inside bend and then it slopes as you get to the back side of it and it's a, you know outgoing current on that side that, that's going to be a low-lying current area as well yeah. that's a really high percentage area for good fish absolutely i agree with that and when you're looking for those depressions in the bottom and stuff like that what mm-hmm. is your go-to source to find that like a guy's listening he's like all right i'm gonna go fish the james river this weekend What's what's the best source to try to find those depressions and stuff in the bottom? Side imaging. Side imaging. Because you you know you can get your uh, you can get out 100, 150, 200 feet. Yeah. And as you're you're rolling along, if you see that shaded area, that's that's you know that return it's a drop off, right? Because right. it's it's not able to to touch the beam's not touching it. So I'll you know if it's on the right side, I'll hang right and go over there and check it out and see how much of an elevation change is it in the depth. And uh, if it looks good and it's got fish in it, set up on it. Absolutely. And how long will you set up on fish a lot of times? Depends on the time of the year and that and that current factor we were talking about earlier. You know, if I, Caleb, if I know there's good fish there, I've graphed them. Um, if I'm setting up and the current's still kind of slow or it just has changed, you know, I'll give it a couple hours, you know, for the uh, current to start rolling good. And more times than not, man, I can't tell you how many times I've set up on good fish and slower current scenarios, but I know there's a, a stronger current coming and it's like an on switch, man. Like you're, you're there, you're ready. And I've had times, man, where I've had three, four five rods go down at once when it, ty- when it starts getting towards the peak. It's a lot of fun. Dude. Anytime I see like multiple rods go down, yeah, I feel like the, that's the best, right? The guy that people like look at me and they're like, has this guy ever caught a big fish? Cause like, I'm just like wigging out. I just, it's just something in you. That's just like a kid again. I mean, you just, mm-hmm. you're fighting a fish and another rod gets torqued down. It's just, that's the best feeling ever. Yeah. A lot, Tidal river. It's, it's a lot of when and where I, I, I constantly find myself, especially when I, I take customers fishing in my mind, you know, if I was fishing a tournament or just trying to, you know, I'm always going after trophy size fish. Yeah. I know where they're at, but when they're going to bite, may not be at the exact time i need them to put customers on fish but you know i'll try to get a feel for who i'm taking fishing and you know if they're willing to to wait it out and not they don't just a lot of people just want to catch fish right yeah. but to, to catch a, a good size fish you need to be patient yeah wait them out it's best your time do a lot of graphing that's a big thing so don't, putting your time on on the water right and don't anchor too quick on something if you see a couple good fish Keep rolling, man. Keep looking. You know, drop drop a waypoint. Drop a waypoint. You know, you can come back to them. But if you're, you know, you're graphing and you mark one good one, you know, chances are if you keep going and looking and maybe going up a ledge or traveling the flat a little further, you might run into a lot more and increase your percentages. Gosh, you're right. You're you're so right. And you know far more than me when it comes to, to targeting trophy cabin. Far more. 
the only thing that I have to look back on is when I was fishing all the time. And that statement right there was so right. We go back to that 111 and that scene. If you go back to that video, there was like eight big fish like right there. Yeah. It yep. is much, I would much rather. And, you know, we're, we were scanning for a while because there was nothing there. And it wasn't that I was some great fisherman that, that did. I, I, I looked for, I applied some of those principles like you're talking about, which, which improves your chances. Absolutely. But man. as we were scanning, there was one here, one here maybe two and i was like it's I, I i have much better odds of catching a big fish if i can get at least see a little bit more activity right you got to be observant right you know as you're rolling along and graphing you mark a good fish you know don't stop keep going because something's changing in that environment that fish is there for a reason yep he's got buddies Keep going, keep looking, yep. and chances are you're going to find a, a lot more in that type of water, whatever the condition is. Yep. Yeah. When you said don't anchor up too quickly on something, that was yeah. that was key because I knew I never would have caught that fish if I was like, oh man, here's a big fish right here. Let's anchor up on him and fish it. Mm -hmm. It was let's get around a little bit more high probability here. Yep. And uh, and throw the anchor. That that was so good. Don't don't anchor up too quick on a spot. I like that. For sure. I like that. And now, do you do any kind of, like, drifting on the river, or do you like anchoring the best? Primarily up there, it, it's anchor fishing. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, that is something that I keep in uh, in my tool bag. If if the uh, bite's kind of slow, fish are, uh, if they're up traveling, I'll, I'll go drift the channel or uh, maybe a, a deeper flat 20 to 25 foot just yeah. out of that heavy current where I can control the speed of the the boat i'll drop the trolling motor and do some uh down lines yeah and uh that, that that can be uh especially this time of year getting into the spring that's a really good tactic drifting actually i did a little bit some last weekend with some customers and uh, put some fish in the boat yeah and especially drifting in that current i mean when you're drifting and you hook a big fish you're not pulling him against current right it's literally you're fighting him in in you're drifting with him, so you're getting all the power of the and fish. It, and it is a better scenario when you've got uh, uh, newcomers to the sport and, mm -hmm. and people who aren't as uh, skilled with working a big fish. Because a lot of times that current can be a struggle bus when you've, you've right. got a fish, you know, 40, 50, 60 pounds. It, a lot of times I've had to help them actually get it in. They're not strong enough to get the fish in. So. Right, right. You know, suspending baits, drifting with the current, you get to feel the fish, you get to feel his energy. Um, I feel like that is a really good tactic. Yeah. For sure. What about also something that comes up a lot of times is wind. You know, when it's real windy when when you're on the river mm -hmm. or when you're headed to the river and the wind is up. Like here lately, we've had nothing but crazy wind. And I know it's been windy where you're at. Does wind change your approach any when you're fishing for catfish on the river and where you go, how, you know, how you anchor up. Yeah, it, it most certainly does. And, and, you know, if you were asking me this question years ago, I'd say, man, it's like deer hunting. If it's wind's blowing, I'm staying home. But, yeah. uh, you know, now that I'm, I'm having to, uh, put people on fish or just enjoy catching fish. Yeah. You know, you obviously you got to find a scenario where you can get out of the wind. Yeah. You, you know, look, look at your, uh, wind direction. If it's coming out of the North try to find something on that side of the river that's protected to where you, cause you lose all your boat control when the wind's blowing, yeah. right? When you, when you get on anchor, it's a pain in the butt. Yeah. You can put a drift sock out to try to fight it. But if it's, if you're out in the middle of the river somewhere and you have nothing protecting you, when the current start, when the current does slow down enough, you're going to start whipping and your rods lines are going to start getting tangled. So I, w I would definitely recommend, uh, getting out of it, getting protected. Yeah. First thing you're going to have to do is try to determine uh, where the fish are at, where they're feeding, what that magic number and depth is for the day. You know, kind of lean back lean back into what I was saying earlier. Maybe do your first set. Because usually wind picks up throughout the day. So that morning you're going to have an opportunity uh, not to have to deal with such a heavy wind. Do, do a set on the channel edge or something. Get some bait shallow, some, you know, in that 20, 30-foot range and then some deep. And then... If that is successful and you figure out what uh, what depth they're biting at, then look at your map and find some water that's kind of that depth out of the wind. Yeah. 
<clears throat> Absolutely. I like that. Yeah. I I asked that because, you know, some guys, you know, they will go with that approach that the wind's blowing, you know, I ain't getting on the river, you know, like that. But like you said, with being a guide, it's kind of making you like, all right, we got to find you these. You got to go. These, you got to do it, right? In these circumstances, you know, you do. Let me ask you uh, something about fish finders. What kind of fish finder are you currently running? Uh, I run a, I run a Simrad. Yeah. Uh, just recently switched over to Simrad. I, I had, I started with a rant on, on my first boat 12, 13 years ago. Um, went with a hummingbird. Hummingbird's great graph. Yeah. But I feel like uh, Simrad, the, the processing speed is faster, if you will. Um, the 2D imaging and down imaging on them are awesome they have this thing called uh, have you ever run one or seen one i have seen simrads uh fishing for um striper in the chesapeake bay when we were designing the striper stealth rods and they are bad yeah they, ha they have this technology they call it a fish reveal mm -hmm. they're down imaging and what that does uh the fish's swim bladder it changes the color of it right. right whatever color palette like i have mine set up for green and red like the, the body of the fish will be green and then his swim bladder will highlight red. And that, that really gives you a good indication of how large the fish is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, uh, I highly recommend Simrad. They're, they're a really good graph, man. That's really cool. And the reason I ask is I wanted to know what you were using. And then also when you're going over a spot or you're checking a spot, how much of it is I have to see fish on this particular structure or contour I have to see fish and then how much of it is my gut is telling me the conditions are right for this. Sure. A lot of that, see them, but right. A lot of that can be instinctive and we're going to circle back around to that tide thing. Mm -hmm. Um, if the tide is going, you know, for six hours in one direction, it's going to help group fish up, not just the catfish or targeting bait fish. Right. Uh, Let's use this example. Um, say you've got a big mud flat off the main channel and you've had incoming tide and you're just getting there to the boat ramp. And by the time you get to the area you want to start looking, it's going to be outgoing tide. That's a good place to set up, Caleb, uh, just at the, the start of a ledge coming off of a flat. Because when the water starts receding, everything's going to want to start kind of sucking back towards the channel. And even though there's not, you know, good fish there, if it's kind of like a traveling corridor for him to get back to the channel, if he's been up there at night feeding in that shallow water, you can get him on the way back to the channel to deeper water as that sun's starting to come up. That That is a really, uh, uh, can be a high productive scenario in the mornings. That's a really good tip right there. I love fishing outgoing tide first thing in the morning. Absolutely. And I like <clears throat> how you, you were describing how those fish view that outgoing tide. Like you said, you know, you imagine... Uh, a guy's listening, you imagine like creek arms coming off your river and on, especially on a tidal river in certain parts where the water was going in, mm -hmm. those bait fish and the fish travel, you know, in there. And then when the tide's going out, that's a spot where the f bait fish are going to get pulled out of that creek arm, follow the current and Absolutely. those fish know it. And they're staged right there for them to come out and say, mm -hmm. right over here. It's the, it's the, we, get, we can relate it back to the food chain, right? You know, you, yep. you brought up a good point, you know, creeks and stuff. You know, they're shallower, but at high tide, you know, the water comes up two, three, four feet sometimes on a good spring tide. That's allowing a lot of the smaller fish to get back there and prey on the little minnows and stuff and whatever mm -hmm. they're foraging on. The catfish are going to follow them, and then that cycle is going to reverse when it starts going out. And they're going to stage them right there at the door and uh, catch them coming out. That's right. Another good one on uh, – on an incoming tide set up in a creek mouth. Okay, that's good. You know, I'm glad you said that, Christian, because I feel like people could talk forever about fishing the outgoing tides. And mm -hmm. I love to hear it because it's so interesting. Um, and it, it makes a lot of sense how, how fish are, are, are staged up when water is pulling out of something. That's right. I've always been more curious about incoming because... Of course, you talk to people who say, I prefer incoming tide fish, but 
from my experiences talking with people, they like that out. They tide. love that outgoing tide. So yep. tell us again what you just said about the incoming tide. A good thing to look for. Any look at your map. Find some creek mouths, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, a creek mouth is going to be a natural funnel, if you will. You're coming off the main river into a creek. Uh, I tend to set up. I'll try it a couple different ways, to be honest with you. If it's at the beginning of incoming tide, I'm going to be a couple hundred yards on the flat outside of the mouth. Mm -hmm. And as you're getting closer to that that peak where the current's running really good, I'll move in towards the mouth to where it's necking down into that creek. Right. And uh, that that is a really good productive uh, time to fish an incoming tide. So do you feel like on the incoming tide going – toward those shallower places where like the bait fish and stuff go do you feel like that's a good spot i mean like looking at shallower when incoming tide yeah yeah definitely because what what that there again we're coming back to you know the fish or or their habits are a product of their environment right if that water level is raising in those backwaters and those creeks and stuff they're, you know, especially a big fish, he's going to be able to get places he normally wouldn't mm-hmm. and potentially get, uh, it'd be an opportunity for him to get an easy meal because there's a lot of uh, bait fish back there. Absolutely. I think about, I'm about to go on vacation to the beach and I know I'm going to be taking my little nephew and um, taking him fishing. And the reason I when, I, when I heard you say that, I was thinking to myself, we do best when the tide's coming in because it brings those those fish in Mm -hmm. also do land based shark fishing where i kayak baits off the beach and our biggest fish come when the tide's coming in it seems like those bigger fish now again we're talking saltwater and return but you know it seems like all the fish Mm -hmm. you know have an instinctive nature and our biggest fish when we're doing that tends to come when the tide is coming in closer to the shore where it normally is shallow where they wouldn't try to get in there right when the tide's coming in they don't mind going in there because they know they're not going to get stuck right and i guess my my rationale for that is um it's kind of like you said they know they're not going to get stuck but the the smaller fish that they feed on that's been hanging out there all day you know kind of in that secure zone it's not so secure anymore it's not and that, and that, I think that is, is something you definitely, as an angler fishing tidal water, you need to look at is uh, how the tide infects the environment. Right. Absolutely. That's that. That's killer. Do you have any more things that you've ever really noticed about incoming tide? I mean, is it really? I mean, do you have anything else that you've noticed about about incoming? Because mm. you're kind of above the fall line where you predominantly fish. Do you or no? Or does it? Uh, no, it comes. Yeah, we're fall line meaning where there's no tide yeah we're like the that's on the other side of richmond so every, everything i fish is tidal okay i yeah. knew i knew you fish tidal um mm-hmm. but then i know like some of these pictures you know that you've sent me before i'm like that spot right there it looks like it could be above you know the fall. it's just it looks like it's more neck down you might have just been in the creek or somewhere like that or yeah i, tr- I treat incoming tide just you know for the majority of the time just as i do an outgoing tide i still yeah. look for the same things in terms of setups you know it, it, it also generates a feeding cycle when it when it peaks on incoming they fish tend to start feeding a little bit heavier as well so i try to look for areas that i know are holding fish and even though they're not feeding right there at that particular time when you get more current flow that on switch is going to hit and uh, if you're just pacing a lot of times you'll get that good bite you've been waiting on absolutely absolutely that's that's killer information right there um <clears throat> christian and i feel like let me see what where are we at on this yeah we've already been 50 minutes guys it always wow. amazes really? me how that's long crazy. almost an hour how long i mean how fast time goes when we're talking about stuff like this and i know guys i Usually I try to stick with a theme and like kind of start you at the boat ramp and then we work our way around. But um, I really just kind of wanted to just as things pop in our mind, we kind of talk about it. And uh, I feel like we've jumped around to some really good topics. We've gotten into um, bait, you know, how, how you're hooking your bait, what type of bait that you would use, how you're targeting the bait. Um different areas to look for what to look for some of your favorite spots to look for anchoring up i mean we we really got a lot of really good information like incoming outgoing and uh 
I, I feel like there's a lot of good information here that's going to help a lot of guys. And yeah, that's, the, that's the goal, right? Yeah, and I, I had some emails that got sent to me. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, message Fish and Fuel on Facebook, you know, comment on our YouTube channel, or email uh, fishandfuel1 at gmail.com. And I had a guy email me, and he said, uh, I'd like to hear more about what the gear guys are using. He said, I'm new to catfish, and I, I don't, I don't, I don't know about the uh, the gear, you know, so much. And Amanda will tell you in the office, a lot of guys that are buying our rods, you know, they're like, what kind of reel do you recommend? Right. So what size reel are you using? What pound line? And then sure, what sure. power of rods are you using to to target these fish in, in current? I, I'm currently uh, running 25 alt pin fathoms. Uh, that, that 25, what it's signifying is it'll hold 300 yards of 25 pound line. But uh, I'm running 40 pound line, uh, Berkeley uh, Prospect Chrome, mm-hmm. and uh, our leader line. I love that stuff. It's, Slime line leader line. Yeah, I love that stuff. It's good stuff, man. It, it is a really good leader line. Yeah. Uh, we talked about the hooks I'm using earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, lead wise, you know, some of the, the outside rods that I'm using that I don't want the baits to be swept back, I'm putting 14 to 16 ounces of lead on them. And usually ones out the back, I'm using that 10 to 8 ounce range. Right. And then in terms of rods, I use our Hellcat rods. I love those rods. Really good rod. And you I've said you're using those. the heavy power? Yeah, I use the heavy out the back. And then the ones on the outside, I use the extra heavy. Right. Just just so I can, if I'm, if I'm trying to cover a big area and I want to throw a bait really good, the heavies will throw a 16 ounce weight, no yeah. problem. But that extra heavy will launch. <laughs> right you know it's a piece of lead it will it loads up beautifully on on yeah. some big lead but my i would say action wise fighting the fish and current the, the heavy action's my favorite all right it's just a lot of fun good deal well i told that guy i said i will make sure that i i talk more about and and let guys know you know what they're using because they're getting all this good information about how to target them and stuff but they're like man we'd like to know what they're kind of using to you know, every day successfully catch fish. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Maybe uh, as this progresses mm-hmm. with, with your uh, podcast channel, maybe you could uh, do like a, a what kind of like what you did with Zach the other day. That, that's really cool because you got some good fit. I think I commented on there, you know, how he uh, changes up his rigging throughout the year absolutely. when drifting. Because, that I mean, that I only think that gentleman has an anchor on his boat. No, he doesn't. Yeah, he, so he's like the drift master. So I would, I'm, sure I'm looking forward to that podcast. I would hate to be his trolling motor. <laughs> he's probably he probably goes through them. I would imagine, guys. Uh, if you're if if you're watching this, um, the podcast previously before was Tyler Barnes uh, state record, and then you just watched the uh, uh, Shane Walser on uh, targeting crappy uh, trophy crappy, and now this podcast here um, with Christian talking about. Uh, targeting trophy catfish in uh, rivers. I did one with uh, Zach Royce that's coming up. Uh, the The show will be out uh, here next. And um, the guy, he does not have an anchor on his boat. I mean, Zach Royce is trolling for ro- uh, trolling for catfish, drifting all the time. And uh, yeah, I'd hate to be his trolling motor, man. <laughs> for real. It puts in work, I'm sure. He's told me before, like the hour log on his trolling motor. And it is insane. It's ridiculous. If I was going to buy a trolling motor. I'd want the one that he's been using. I know. I'd for say, real. Zach, what's your opinion? What which, what trolling motor should I buy? He what's going to hold would, up? Yep, for real. He'd be a good one to ask. Yeah. If you're a trolling motor company and you're listening to this, you need to sponsor Zach Royce because if it's good, he's using it every day. <laughs> 300, he said he fished 300 days a year. That's, that's insane. 300 days a year. I mean, you're talking like 15 to 20 charters a month. And then do you fish? Let me ask you this. Do you fish on your own free time? Like, would you drop people off at the ramp and then you go back and fish? Sometimes. Uh, April, the last two months have been really busy, Caleb. I was, I was actually telling my wife i actually took this weekend off good for you i, had, I hadn't had a day off in like six weeks I've right been, i've been doing because tri- i work full-time job yeah monday through thursday i'm operations manager at a, a foundry yeah they're close to where i live but i've been fishing friday saturday sunday friday saturday sunday 
and I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to be, uh, my birthday's this Tuesday. I'm 40 years old. I'm starting, right. I'm starting to feel that age, yeah, if you bro. will, running five, six weeks with, you know, five hours of sleep every night. That's getting tough on the old man. Yeah. So I, I took this weekend off. But to answer your question, there are a lot of times where I, I've dropped customers off and went back out. Sure. Man. I, I love to fish, brother. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm never going to get enough of it. That's awesome. Yeah, people ask, you know, all the time, you know, guides, you know, are they tired? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's a tiring job. Look, people sure. say, oh, man, you're so lucky. You know, you're you're a guide. You get to fish all day. They don't know what it takes to prepare for trips. Yeah, catfishing guide, you know, that's one of the more uh, labor intensive if yeah. you're guiding because, you know, we're, we're catch, getting up early, catching fresh bait. A lot of your uh, charter captains that target various species, they're using artificial bait. Right. They, they they wake up the same time their yeah. customers do. You don't have a little purple crankbait tied on, ready to put your customer's boat and get straight on the fish. You have to catch bait to go fish. And that's why I think, yeah, there'll be some people who'll be like, oh, catfish, that's just that's just so easy, blah, blah, blah. No, it's not. Because and it teaches you a lot. I can sit, I can, I can talk. When I was fishing all the time, and you can relate to this too because you're out there all the time too. When I'm catching my own bait, some days I am catching herring. I might net uh, uh, crappy. Mm -hmm. I might net um, gizzard shad, threadfin shad. I might, uh, I've thrown the net and caught 15 largemouth in, in a net. You see so much, and it also helps you with understanding your graph. Mm -hmm. Because if you're running your down imaging and you're you're seeing how the fish are spaced out, the size of the fish, and you're like, what is that? What is a bunch of it? I think it's bait. You throw it and it's crappy. Now you know. That's a very good point. That that yeah. taught me a lot as I as I learned how to throw a net better. Yes. Um. You you like you said you see the fish now on the you graph. Know. You throw the net. Now you know what that shad or that perch or that bass. Yep. You or, can you can ride through there. What it there returns like? Yep. That's what this is. And if you're not fishing for a species that requires you to catch your own bait, mm -hmm. I mean that's just something that you can miss out on. And that's right. just something if you, you know, if you did, you, you would you would learn. And I, I mean, I, when I caught those fifteen largemouth, I was like, all right, I don't do a lot of bass fishing, but you know, what time of year for is it? Okay, it's spring. Yeah. I'm in this circumstances. You know. It, it, but you lo you logged it to memory, right? Yeah, it's, it's like I was saying earlier: be observant always. But when you're being observant, have a good memory. Yeah, that, that is a uh, uh, very crucial. I feel like absolutely. And if you catching your bait enough, and you know what the crappy look like, and you're netting crappy all the time, when somebody's like, "Yeah, you know, this time of year they're right up against the bridge ponds and stuff," and you're like, "Oh yeah, I know," because mm -hmm. they get in my net all the time. You That's know, right. commercial fishermen are also very educated on fish patterns and stuff like that um i have some uh some contacts up in there in the the region where i fish that are you know commercial net guys and i yeah. actually the, the woman that makes my gill nets for me her uh a friend has been a commercial fisherman up there for 60 years wow i tell you Caleb, when i get an opportunity He's to got sit, crazy just, knowledge just sit down with that guy which is not as often as i would like because we're all so busy right what he has seen in that the course of those 60 years is uh very valuable knowledge absolutely sure. absolutely he's like the crane on the bank you know i always tell people i say that's the best fisherman on the water because he fishes for a living mm -hmm. you know i mean he he's fishing to survive. to survive that's right you know he ain't out here just playing around he knows if he don't catch fish he don't eat that's a good point so uh i look at uh, you know commercial fishermen a lot of times is they're the same thing where mm -hmm. they see different things that come across and uh you know, they, they, they know I mean, the they, they're doing it to put food on the table. So, you know, yeah. they're, they're giving it 110% yeah. from the minute they put the boat in the water to the yeah. time they take it out. Yeah. So. I'd like to have that guy on this podcast. I feel like he'd have a lot of good information. Biologists too. Biologists. Yeah, a biologist would be a good one. That would just be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. They got to get the data. Well, Christian, thank you so much for coming up here on the show. Sure. I mean, this is just great. And guys, I got some, some news for you. If you're watching this podcast and you want to go book a trip with Christian Moore. The first person to reach out to him and contact him to reserve your trip and pay your deposit, F Fish and Fuel is going to pay 
half of your uh, guide fee. Uh, so you're going to get a killer good deal. We're going to pay Christian half the guide fee. fee. So if it's you and another person, you're going to get a trip at a killer, killer deal. So you have to be the first person to reach out to. How can people contact you? Because they're going to be listening. They'll be like, oh, man, that's a 50% off guide trip on a trophy, a world-class fishery. People travel all over to get to the body of water that you fish on. Sure. Well, a knowledgeable angler, how can they contact you? I would say the best way to get in touch with me, Caleb, is my cell phone number, 336-988-1394. Drop me a text. Uh, another good one is uh, on my Facebook business page or my personal account, Christian Fishes More or Real Country Guide Service on Facebook. Yeah. Any of those avenues would work. That's awesome. And not only uh, are you going to get a 50% off trip, but we're also going to uh, supply you and a friend uh, with a Hellcat rod, uh, one of our newest models out. So uh, if you call and book with him, uh, I'm going to have those rods, give those to, to Christian. And uh, when you show up, you're also going to get, uh, it's right at it's about $300 in, in brand new rods. Wow, that's so awesome. If it's just one person, they're still going to get two rods. So if it's, it's a good guy right there, guys. Well, I mean, it's, it's it, Christian's a, good, a, a great guy and an a awesome fisherman. And uh, I, I'm doing it because I want to see somebody go out there and have a killer day. And look, even if Christian's one of those people, even if it was raining sideways and Christian said, look, we'll still go out there and the fishing was miserable, just the knowledge and that you can get just by asking him questions. Oh, absolutely. Well, yeah. Fast forward your time on the water. So there's no, I, I know we all book guide trips and we're all looking to just crank on the rod all day, but also go to, uh, to learn because his knowledge would cost you tens of thousands of dollars in fuel, time, gear, all that. And you can get that in one trip. That's a really good point, Caleb. You know, I'll, I remember a lot of guided fishing trips that I, I went on with my father. Uh, I'm bugging the heck out of that captain. I'm asking him questions. Yeah. And, and a lot of times, uh, they are a little tight lipped. Yeah. They, they don't want to answer those questions. I just want to let y'all know if you, you ask me a question, I'm going to give you a, a wholehearted, clear answer. I like that. And, uh, try to help you out the best I can. Absolutely. Well, Christian, thank you again for being on the show. Y'all reach out to Christian Moore and uh, get a hold of them. And you've also got Facebook pages. Um, I do. Yes, sir. For your guide service and stuff like that. And uh, we're going to also, in the in the comments below, in the, in the link, we're also going to have uh, his website and uh, Facebook page link and phone number in there. So if you want to look on here as well. So uh, if also, if you have any questions about this podcast, if you'd like for us to follow up with Christian and, and, and ask him some questions, um, leave it in the comments. Let us know how we're doing. And uh, we appreciate you tuning in for another episode of the Fish and Fuel podcast, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.